for having all of us here uh, on the stage and I'm happy that we could accommodate here. Uh, so uh, there are two reasons for having uh, uh, these stakeholders here in this uh, panel discussion. Uh, we, have, we have merged the two panel discussions. The two panel discussions are one was on sustainable mobility and other is on electric vehicle transition in India. So uh, this discussion will definitely uh, go in the line of how India is achieving sustainable, mobil sustainable mobility. And as we all know that electric vehicle and having electric mobility is one of the key aspects of making the mobility ecosystem of the country more and more sustainable. So uh, uh, that is why we are having the speakers of both the sessions here joining us in this panel discussion. And uh, to start with uh, uh, discussing uh, with the stakeholders, the eminent leaders present here from various uh, parts of the country, you can see north, west, south, east, all the parts of the country are represented here in this panel discussion. And all the other, all the different aspects of uh, uh, mobility is, is here. They are, they, you will find principal secretary transport here. You will find metro uh, uh, stakeholder here. You will find city, uh, smart city CEO here. So urban stakeholder, city manager, uh, metro, road transport, all the, uh, and all, in fact also uh, one stakeholder from energy uh, sector. So all are here uh, for the discussion. So I'll request my colleague Arpit Gupta to start the uh, discussion with the question to the first speaker. Thank you, Karthik. Usually post-lunch sessions are not that energetic, but the kind of panel we have here, stalwarts from across the country, they have joined us. Uh, so without uh, wasting any time, uh, I'll directly go to the first panelist of this uh, esteemed panel discussion, uh, none other than Mr. Loknath Behra asking the first question, sir. We are discussing about future of mobility, sustainable transport, and transport ecosystem since morning. So the topic for this panel discussion that we are having today is achieving sustainable mobility, consumer-friendly approach. So could you please uh, describe what has been your experience with sustainable mobility and what kind of initiatives the Kerala government, especially Kochi Metro, has undertaken uh, in the state. Over to you. At the outset, I thank uh, Economic Times and uh, the distinguished uh, co-panelists and distinguished uh, people in the audience. First of all, I must confess one thing. What is sustainable mobility? I only understood after I joined the Metro. What I don't, I did not know what is sustainable material. I mean, if you go by lexicon and the dictionary meaning of sustainable, which actually sustains. So the question is, when I would request, because you are from the fourth estate, better actually teach people that what is sustainable. We people actually sitting in very good air conditioned atmosphere and talking about sustainable doesn't mean actually it is anything called sustainable. First, this I also spoke in an indirect way in the UMI conference, which happened uh, very recently in Kochi. Okay, right. Going by sustainable, you think that we'll have to take care of climate change, we have to do this, environmental protection, and kind of things. So many things have put together. So then the integration of tickets, intermodal integration, so many things put together makes the entire thing very complicated. Now, let us actually talk in terms of the sustainable for whom? Sustainable for the metro company or the bus company? Or the, it is sustainable for the people? That's the first question actually is to be answered. If it is sustainable for the people and they do not know, probably they do not know, they know one thing that if I travel by metro or by best, which is one of the finest services in the country, uh, I, I will reach in time and uh, everything will be there. But whether we should say that is sustainable transport. According to your, I mean, definitions, it has to be and so many things. Okay. 
going by Cochin is one of the, as many of you must have visited, I don't though belong to Cochin, is one of the finest and most beautiful cities in this country. Because 27% of the city is filled with water and beautiful water. I mean, the Wembanad actually is a kind. So it had a very robust water transport system for thousands of years. Now, what we thought is that we brought, we brought the one and only in the world, the water metro, which is going to be inaugurated. It is basically, a, again, a sustainable kind of thing because this is the boat which we had adjusted as the best boat in the world two weeks back. And this boat is making India and it is actually noiseless. It is uh, runs uh, in a hybrid mode, mostly electricity, goes to around 10 knot speed. It has the LTO battery, which is the safest battery, though costly. And so many new uh, ones, have been number ones in the world, we did it. And we have got the best ITMS system also there. That is integrated to the metro. So you buy a ticket for uh, water metro, you can travel there in the metro. I mean, uh, water metro as well as in the metro. Now, the question sustainable, again, I am talking about how do you actually ensure the first mile and last mile connectivity, which is there also intrinsically built in the sustainable transport. So the biggest problem I was talking in the morning to some of the experts that the first mile connectivity is the challenge. Last mile connectivity is, of course, a challenge, but not that big challenge as a first mile. Because I want to come out of my house in the morning to go to the office and then to my medical store, to my mother's place. All these things together, I actually use different modes of transport. Like in the city of London, you buy a day pass or a day card. You travel in any mode of transport, there is no issue. But here, actually, with all the technologies available, no city can boast of that particular thing. We did it to a limited extent. But now the question, the challenge is this. Suppose the auto rickshaw comes to your sustainable integration, intermodal integration. Then what happens? He, at the end of the day, wants the money to be deposited in his account. And how, do, how does it happen? And secondly, he says that if you put a hardware for read the card or anything to read the application through a scanning methodology or whatever, who will bear the cost of that particular machine? So these things complicate. So what we have done, which can be done anywhere, Jaipur, se shuru karke, Banaras, jahan bhi ho, aap kar sakte. What happens is very simple. The simple thing is that go by software solution. It will be only based on a code, a division of code like the CDMA. So what you have to do is that the code is downloadable from an app, like Arjit has beautiful, very, very friendly. Thanks, Arjit, it's very beautiful. I must compliment you. And uh, this particular kind of thing, it will download a QR code. Um, and it will download, and you, with that QR code, neutralization of the QR code and the payment takes place inside the vehicle itself. So this is what we are actually experimenting. I'm sure that by March we will roll it out. That will be first time in the country. And we will do that. And I'm, I promise, I assure, this will not be IPR protected. We'll give it to anybody who wants. So that is what a person wants. My experience in Cochin is that some in, everybody wants integration. But we are not taking them on board as bureaucrats or as the policy makers. We have to do it. Srijit, my transport commissioner, he has taken a lot of things for the entire state. I am only talking about Cochin City. Cochin City is going to be the mission mode project which will be replicated elsewhere. So this is what I thought I should talk to the people that intermodal integration is the key. Because if you are talking about a sustainable transport, think about the people, not the organization only. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you for sharing your thoughts around sustainable mobility and how your uh, experiments, how fruitful your experiments have been in Kochi. So taking uh, your thoughts that you said that last mile connectivity is not a challenge, but first mile is. 
I'll go to our next panelist in this uh, esteemed panel uh, group of panelists. Uh, Mr. Lokesh Chandra, you lead the one of the largest city transport uh, services corporation, BEST, uh, in the state of Maharashtra. So what are the most significant challenges to achieve sustainable mo mobility? And uh, uh, that is also user friendly, if I would ask. Over to you. Very good afternoon to all. In fact, uh, just to give a background of the organization I am heading, BEST is a 150-year-old uh, public transport utility catering to 1.6 crore Mumbaikers with daily ridership of 35, 35 lakh commuters and having a fleet size of 3,700 buses. At the moment, we are having the largest fleet of uh, electric buses in India, around 410 we are running. Now, as far as uh, the challenges and uh, commuter-friendly approaches which we have initiated in the BST to make uh, the operation sustainable, I like to share some of the initiative we have started in last one year. See, the urban bus tran transport system has got two inherent problems. One is the quality, another is the reliability. Now, quality is basically due to inadequate fleet size, old fleet, and then at the same time it is uh, uh, again coupled with the bad financial condition of the city transport utilities. We have reliability issue because in the present scenario, there is uh, no information available to the commuter who is coming to a bus stop when the next bus is coming. So to address these two basic issues, what we have done to ensure that our public bus transport system is reliable, efficient, commuter friendly, at the same time it's environment friendly and self-sustainable. We have started with some basic uh, systematic reforms in which we have tried to improve the frequency of the buses within the existing fleet. What we did, we looked at the data, we realized around 85% of the commuters are having a ridership of up to 7 kilometers. That gives us some insight to do the route rationalization as well as fleet rationalization. Now as a result, what has happened the frequency of some of the bus routes, which was more than an hour or 45 minutes, has gone down to 20 minutes. Now, second aspect was the reliability or giving the information in real time to the commuters. We have started the vehicle tracking and we have launched an app which gives in the real time the actual location of the bus. It also gives the crowdedness in the bus and also provides the ticketing solution you can use the app for getting the ticket without waiting at the bus stop or standing in the queue. Second thing which we have done to promote the digital payments along with this app, we have also started closed loop card as well as the NCMC card. In fact, uh, we are the first uh, bus utility in India who has launched the NCMC card in last April. Now, these initiatives has helped us a lot in the form of increased ridership. In the last six to eight months, our ridership has gone by 35%. It has already crossed the pre-COVID levels. Our revenues has also gone from 1.6 crore per day to 2.3, 2.4 crores per day. And at the same time, it has reduced the waiting time at the bus stops. So monthly on average, we are saving 6 lakh productive man days of the commuters on the monthly basis for those who are using our bus network. At the same time, now what is the option? When we are looking for the fleet augmentation, how can we make these operations sustainable, which are environment friendly at the same time cost effective also? Now for me as a bus operator, I think Sustainability more is related to my making the operations more uh, financial viable. 
And if I can also look at the environment aspect while doing so, I think that will give me double benefit of making it more uh, sustainable. So as a policy decision, what we have done, we have taken a decision to increase the fleet size by three times. So by year 2026, our fleet size will be 10,000 buses. By next year end, it will be around 7,000. So it will be the double of the present size. By doing so, what we have done, we looked at the various options, whether we should go for the diesel buses, CNG buses, or the electric buses. Now, normally when we talk about the electric buses, the first question comes into mind, how we can afford, because it's very, very costly. But if you look at the life cycle cost of the operation, because the bus is going to stay for 12 to 15 years, we found that it is the most economical viable solution as far as the cost of operation is concerned. Now, if I look at the per kilometer cost of fuel, in case of electric bus, if it is X, in case of CNG, it is 3X, and in case of diesel, it is 5X. So 15% is the capital cost of the bus for this 15-year operation. 85% is the cost of operation and maintenance. So after doing all these uh, calculations, we realized, and we have taken a decision that we will be going for 100% electric vehicles. Now, with this, how we can further reduce the cost of operation? Because my per kilometer cost of operation today is 150 rupees, and my cost uh, per kilometer realization is around 49 rupees. So how to bridge this 100 rupees? So the digital, uh, the uh, technological intervention which we have done, we have started in our uh, organization is going for digital buses. At present, we are running 250 digital buses, basically which are fitted with the tap-in, tap-out facility. So we have reduced the cost of conductor. At the same time, we have gone for the gross cost contract model where we have reduced the cost of operation by outsourcing the bus operation where the bus comes with the driver with the maintenance cost. So per kilometer cost which we have discovered from the uh, market by the bidding is now come down to 46 rupees per kilometer. Now further to this, to take care of uh, first mile and last mile connectivity, we have started e-bikes. In fact, uh, wherever we don't have the bus network, we have the app-based uh, operated uh, e-bikes where anybody who want to use it, download the app, and then you can operate that bike as per your requirement and leave it at the designated places. My bus stops are having these designated places where uh, they, you can take it, and then you can leave it at a, another place where, which is nearby to your workplace or maybe your uh, house. Another intervention which we have done is another product which is essentially for promoting more and more people who are using their self-driven cars to switch over to the public transport uh, mode. What we have done, we have started a based luxury bus service, which is basically essentially Ola Uber kind of uh, thing, where you can book the bus, seat in the bus by using the app, make the payment digitally, and you can live track that bus in real time, and you can reach the uh, bus stop from where you have to board it, and then uh, you can complete your journey. In this, now it is a win-win situation because the commuter is paying less than the shared taxi cost. It is, uh, and for self-driven car, it is much more uh, economical. At the same time, my uh, traffic on the road, if the people are shifting from the self-driven cars to uh, these buses, then definitely the traffic congestion on the road will be go down and in turn, it will improve my uh, frequency and uh, travel uh, uh, trip time for the normal uh, bus network. So these are the few of the initiatives which we have recently started. We are also looking for starting the e-cabs in my mm -hmm. brand. So this is kind of one mobility as a service kind of solution under one brand name, as uh, somebody was uh, just uh, mentioning, that if we have to go for different uh, kind of uh, things, then we have to find different kind of uh, uh, transport solutions. So under one brand, we are trying to create these kind of options available where you can travel seamlessly. And in the city also, now we are talking to each, um, uh, like uh, metros and the southern railway uh, network to put their time and the tracking in our app and same thing in their app, we will put our uh, this uh, timetable and network 
So that seamlessly using one app, you can get the information about the various modes of right. transport in the city. Right, right, right. I think uh, it's great to know from you several digital initiatives, electric mobility initiatives the uh, BST is, uh, is taking, and uh, such uh, great work by a government company uh, in terms of uh, providing accessible, affordable, yet a sustainable transport uh, to common people is appreciable. And when we talk of Mumbai, I think Delhi is also no less. And uh, today we have here uh, with us Mr. Ashish Kundra. You must be knowing him recently. He has also delivered his address in COP27 on electric mobility itself. And uh, uh, those who follow him on social media uh, um, will be knowing that Delhi is actually doing a lot of, uh, taking a lot of initiatives in terms of sustainable mobility, in terms of electric mobility, electric vehicle transition. So, uh, Mr. Kundra, I would like to ask you, uh, uh, as far as I know, you are looking, you are aggressively planning and also apply, applying the uh, electric vehicles and uh, uh, government is very aggressive towards electric mobility in uh, NCT uh, Delhi. So, please uh, tell us about that and uh, what is the future of electric mobility in India? Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, so Delhi was, you know, an early starter and like we launched our electric vehicle policy in August 2020. So it's been two years. One year went by in COVID, but uh, I think that notwithstanding, today the numbers are very encouraging. So we are, uh, you know, this year from January to November, 10% of new vehicles registered in Delhi are electric which I think is a, is a very good number, given that uh, there has been a very short span of time in which we have been able to do this. And I think uh, two or three key things. One is, uh, of course, uh, getting the price point uh, comparable to uh, an ICE vehicle. So the policy had a bunch of purchase incentives uh, for two-wheelers, for an initial bunch of four-wheelers, uh, for three-wheelers and e-rickshaws and so on. Uh, important thing is that we have to inspire the trust of the customer that if he buys a vehicle today, uh, within a week, he will get the subsidy into his bank account. So we created a digital framework, so Aadhaar-linked kind of, uh, you know, subsidy payouts, and we have disbursed something like 120 crores uh, of uh, subsidy on electric vehicles so far. Uh, so that is one. But related point is also, I think, some myth busting. So, uh, you know, people who are on the verge of buying a new vehicle, uh, it's not as if, you know, it's a choice between A brand of coffee or B brand of coffee. Uh, it's a very significant decision where price points matter. So, uh, I think strategic communication is a very important uh, uh, element. And what we did was that we partnered with WhatsApp and we created a chatbot and uh, uh, you know we kind of listed out the typical questions which are in your mind what is the range of a vehicle what is the cost uh, per kilometer how much does this cost what are the models available so on and so forth and uh, and you know to everybody who goes to uh, take a driving test who has taken a learner license uh, we shoot out these whatsapp chatbot messages so if I assume that 30% of those are potential buyers, uh, at least some uh, will get converted to, uh, to this uh, mode of thing. The other thing is that uh, we have to have a very robust uh, charging infrastructure in the city uh, so that the range anxiety which people feel uh, should be addressed. And in that, what we did was, uh, one is that we have kind of, uh, in, through the discoms, we have impaneled, uh, you know, 10 uh, charging companies, a uh, mix of slow and fast chargers. We have got uh, a scheme which says, if you buy a charger to install in your home, at your shop, in your mall, in your office, uh, we will give you 6,000 rupees subsidy per charger. Now, slow charger typically costs about 8,500. So, which means more than two-thirds of the cost of the charger is being subsidized. And we have created this for about 30,000 chargers. So, which means about 18 crores we set aside for this uh, project itself. Uh, so far in Delhi, we have about 3,500 um, charge points and our charging action plan uh, basically envisages that we'll have 18,000 charging points by 2025. 
and now we have created teams of officers at the district level who are kind of mapping out. So we've got geo coordinates of all parking lots. We have got geo coordinates also of all EV owners. So we have partnered with Map My India. We have created a geospatial heat map of EV owners, uh, parking lots, charging points. So that the scientific planning of charging infra can happen and we share that with the charging companies. And I think more importantly, we have to have a very active and robust dialogue with all these startups who are dominating this space. Uh, so in a city like Delhi, there are so many players and unless I have a dialogue with them every like once in a month, I would be lost on what they're doing. You know, battery swapping, some, somebody has a plan of installing battery swapping stations in every square kilometer of Delhi and so on. That gives you ideas. So I think net-net, uh, -net, uh, it's a mix of uh, various things. But in the end, I think uh, it's also the customer at the end of the day. Uh, it's economics which counts. Uh, it's not out of altruism people are making that switch for environment. Uh, so let's be real. And uh, I think uh, uh, I think we, can, we are on the right track. That's what I think. Uh, it's not that we have achieved fantastic things, but I think we are on the right track. Yeah. No, so our target of electrification, good question actually, it, uh, uh, our target is that by 2024, 25% of new vehicles sold should be electric. So obviously now as we are going ahead, uh, you know, including the electrification of the bus fleet, uh, uh, you know, for example, for every 100 buses, typically you need about 5 megawatt load. So if I'm planning for 8,000 electric buses by 2025, it means 400 megawatts additional load. Uh, so what we are now uh, telling the fleet operators, particularly, who are running purely electric fleets, that you go for solar charging and battery storage. So uh, that is something which we are doing. Uh, but yes, obviously with a framework of this kind, and uh, I mean, I don't know how rapid this is going to be, but yes, it is going to put a stress on the grid and soon enough we'll have to come out with some, uh, you know, hubs for charging which are solar powered and battery storage. Yeah. Right. Uh, thank you, thank you, Mr. Ashish Kundra, Principal Secretary of Transport uh, in Government of Delhi. Uh, great to know about such uh, electric mobility initiatives in the uh, city of Delhi. And when we talk about uh, elect a fleet of electric vehicles, uh, the Pune has, uh, as, uh, as far as I researched, is one of the largest fleets of electric vehicles. Uh, we have with us Mr. Om Prakash Pakoria, Chairman and Managing Director of Pune Mahanagar Parivan Mahamandal Limited, PMBML. Uh, Bukaria ji, I would like to ask you, Bakoria ji, I would like to ask you that uh, what is the, uh, you know, tell us about the status of electric vehicles uh, in Pune and uh, what are the plans for more EVs uh, in the city of Pune? Thank you, thank you for this. I think uh, Mumbai is the topmost uh, as far as electrical vehicle is concerned. Right now, we are uh, operating 498 buses. And uh, 150 more buses are coming. And in future, uh, we are going to purchase 300 more buses. So by 2030, uh, our mission is to convert all uh, buses, it would be uh, electrical buses. That is uh, what we are planning. And right now we have uh, 15 depots, and uh, five depots are means fully operational, and uh, remaining um, depots we will convert into a electrical depots. So uh, I think uh, next uh, five to ten years we will convert all uh, vehicles, all buses, uh, electrified buses in Pune city. So that is our target, and uh, we need. Uh, means substantial efforts for converting these buses and uh, means in doing so we are there are two types of different uh, obstacles one is related to the technology uh, because the uh, battery cost is almost 50 percent cost of the buses so we are our dependency uh, is on china mainly lithium and based batteries we are importing from the China and one kilowatt hour they are charging almost 
180 dollar to 200 dollars so that is the biggest challenge uh, which india uh, is facing right now so technical uh, technological development as well as uh, infrastructure development that is the major concern for converting these buses into electrical buses so moving next uh, uh, we have also uh, smart city ceo from jaipur so would like to know from Mr. Rajesh Kumar Meena. Sir, how important is it to have a smooth and planned urban mobility system for a livable and smart city? And can you please underline some of the uh, urban mobility related initiatives in the city of Jaipur? Good afternoon, all. I see this question in the context that smooth and planned urban development, urban mobility especially, is very much required for the uh, basic full, to fulfill the basic needs of the people. I'll explain this with an example. Like a person who is living in urban areas has to go out to do his job also. Person has to go to uh, complete his education also. So mobility is required in that sense. Efficient mobility basically, what I'm telling, efficient and inclusive kind of uh, mobility. So. Now I'll come at the basic components that uh, will incorporate the part of this urban mobility. So one should be, as I already mentioned, efficient and inclusive, that it should be affordable to all. And its running should be smooth. And in that context, we have taken certain steps, uh, Jaipur Smart City. Like we have developed uh, some smart parkings. We have developed smart roads. So uh, the main feature of those smart roads are that uh, apart from uh, those uh, roads, carriages we have developed, we have also developed uh, pedestrian friendly uh, footpaths. So, and they have universal access. And uh, apart from this, uh, uh, the main problem we, which we faced in uh, developing this urban mobility initiative was the lack of the space because we were working in the heritage area. So land was limited there. So we tried to make best use of that, like uh, the parkings uh, lane which we designed were uh, designed uh, for making the best possible use of available land. So, uh, and apart from uh, these initiatives, Jaipur Smart City has also developed uh, multi-level car parkings outside the wall city area so that it will help in uh, decongesting uh, the traffic in the wall city area. So, and uh, we have applied some smart solutions also in developing these uh, car parkings. Like we have uh, installed some smart sensors and uh, we have taken it further. Like uh, people can book advance uh, their, uh, their car parkings by paying some uh, small amount. So it will be a big help to those people who are going in the city area and uh, who are not sure that whether they will get the car parking or not. So they can uh, first see the availability of car parkings uh, in those, uh, uh, in the JCL uh, app and uh, uh, on basis of that, uh, they can decide about their commute, commutation. So, these are some of the uh, initiatives taken by the ja Jaipur Smart City. Uh, apart from this, uh, we have also addressed uh, the mobility of uh, emergency services. Like one example I would like to share with you all. Uh, we have experienced that uh, uh, in this crowded uh, area of Wall City, these uh, fire brigade vehicles were not able to pass through smoothly. So, uh, in order to cater that uh, uh, need of the people, so we thought that uh, why not to take the service, emergency services to the people themselves. So, uh, we designed uh, a project and we uh, laid some underground pipelines and connected those pipelines to the nearest pump station. So, this will help in uh, reducing the uh, rounds of the fire brigade vehicle and fire brigade vehicle will get the access to the water from those particular uh, pipelines only. 
uh, which are designed for this purpose and water will be 24 hours available in those pipelines. So these are some of the smart solutions uh, which Jaipur Smart City has introduced in order to make the uh, living standard of pe people of Jaipur better. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Rajesh. I think uh, uh, a city management's role is also very important to ensure urban mobility, sound urban mobility uh, in a city. Uh, uh, apart from, uh, you know, moving people is very important uh, rather than moving vehicle. So definitely city management and, uh, uh, makes a very important role. Uh, and uh, when, uh, now uh, Mr. Kundra spoke about, uh, as we know that in electric mobility, he spoke about charging. There are still uh, persisting challenges uh, with uh, the charging ecosystem uh, in the, uh, for uh, using uh, the electric vehicles. So we have our guest uh, here, Mr. Naveen Sharma, who is an officer on special duty in Rajasthan Renewable Energy Corporation Limited. Uh, Naveen ji, uh, we all know that, uh, yes, uh, electric vehicles are quite sustainable, but still uh, electricity is, uh, again, generation is from mostly from thermal power stations. So again, there is a challenge to sustainability. So when we talk of, uh, you know, having renewable energy as a source of charging, so what other challenges do you see? And uh, they, one is uh, the rates at which uh, the charging is available. It can be a rate. There can be some peak hours of renewable energy, sometimes uh, not the peak hours. So tell us about this uh, uh, some charging related to renewable energy for electric vehicles. Thank you, Karthi. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So the path is very clear. All of, we are all discussing about the mobility issues in urban areas. The total number of EVs sold in 2012 is same as total number of EVs sold per week now in 2022. So that is the pace of transition which we are facing globally. Similarly, we are also seeing that energy demand is rising in almost all the sectors, whether it is buildings or agriculture or industry as well as more so in the electric vehicle zone. So every electric vehicle needs charging, that's obvious, at least once a day, maybe twice or thrice, depending on the, your, uh, how, how, how you are using it, what kind of vehicle you are using it. And the technologies of charging is also evolving every other day. So you have charges ranging from 15 minutes to, say, for a day, you need to charge your vehicle. For, for from a rough, very basic studies and rough estimates, about 100 gigawatts of power, electricity power would be required by 2030 in India to charge electric vehicles on roads. So that is quite a big figure. So how do we meet it? How are discoms are planning to meet this, this, this energy demand, especially for the electric vehicles? So if we are just going the way we are going, then this 100 gigawatts would be, you know, sustained by the traditional coal-based, gas-based or the fossil fuel-based. So the whole purpose of shifting from fossil fuel based transport to electric vehicle based transport would be lost. It's just shifting from one source to another fossil fuel source. So the whole policy push behind promoting electric vehicles is to have a good sustainable climate models in the long run. And the way to attract a customer is about the operational cost is less for electric vehicle, obviously. 10 rupees kilometer in petrol to 2 to 3 rupees per kilometer in the electric vehicle cases. So here comes the role of the policy makers and how to understand the whole scenario which is evolving. As far as the electric vehicle policies and guidelines are concerned, whether it is by the DHI or by the CEA or Ministry of Power, they are very well settled. The subsidies are settled, the, the, the charging standards and all the battery standards are being evolved very well in the country. Just to give a brief perspective of the renewable energy in the state of Rajasthan, just to conclude my brief, you know, reflection on the question which we have raised, Rajasthan is a, is a blessed state when it comes to solar energy. We all know it is the already, in fact, a global capital of solar energy in, in times to come. We are already competing with a state like California and Texas in terms of capacity installed in the Rajasthan. We are right now have 20 gigawatts of renewables capacity installed. We are the largest, biggest exporting, RE exporting state in the country. And, and we already have about 70, 80 gigawatts of investors coming up and lined up and registered in Rajasthan for renewable energy. So we will become one of the, you know, big suppliers for renewable energy in the times to come. 
Now, how to match this huge surpluses available with us to the demand across country? That is a question which we need to which we need to discuss and reflect in, in coming sessions. For example, in 2019, Rajasthan came up with a very progressive solar energy policy in which it was clearly mentioned that how we intend to promote EV-based charging stations and EV-based charging of electric vehicles. For example, first 500 public EV charging stations from solar would be subsidized by 50% as far as the land cost is concerned. We are already processing those applications and UDH, director of local, local bodies, RECO investment, uh, all these departments have already issued notifications in this regard. Similarly, for 10 years, there will be no transmission and wheeling charges when it comes to open access and captive-based draw of renewables for EV charging stations. So these are the small steps which will make, you know, the charging of electric vehicles in next five years, 10 years from the renewables. Unless we do that, unless we develop good business models for the public EV charging stations and also for the charging of my vehicle in my home and in my office in, in idle hours from a subsidized clean green energy, the whole purpose will be lost. So that is all I have to say for the, today's session. Thank you, Naveenji. Moving next, we have uh, Ms. Sonia Arora. She is urban transport expert, Institute of Urban Transport, Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs, Government of India. We heard uh, a lot of stalwarts from uh, different states. And uh, as uh, most of them uh, told us that many cities have experimented with the low emission vehicles, uh, mobility as a service, or, uh, or uh, micro mobility as major options. So I would like to ask you what are, according to you, what are the most significant challenges when it comes to adopting sustainable transport uh, which are customer friendly friendly or user friendly over to you thank you Adir. Uh, first of all i must say thank you to invite me and uh, give me a chance to talk on this important issue uh, in your question there are three things first is sustainable transport then is challenges and the user friendly challenges the sustainable transport as sir has already explained what is uh, sustainable transport it basically includes public transport, non-motorized transport, environment friendly, and other things. So these are the sustainable transport, the broader definition of sustainable transport we talk about. Now, what are the user friendly things which relates to these uh, mode of various modes of transport, especially public transport and non-motorized? As we all are users, we have to get out from our home, we have to go somewhere, for any purpose, we have to uh, uh, do the trip in, in any form and every day. So what we want actually, what we want, we want accessibility, a safe accessibility to public transport or to non-motorized if I am a cycle user or if I am a pedestrian, I need a safe pedestrian pathways. So first of all, I need that. The second, a thing which any user want is whether the system is integrated or not. Like suppose when we go out in, in, in any other country, we say, wow, that, that have a very, that country have a very good system. Hum ek bar ghar se nikalte hain, plan kar lete hain ki ghar se niklenge. Uh, we'll take a cab, we'll take a then uh, metro and then uh, bus or then we go to, we reach to that particular station and then come up. Came back with the same route. So we plan, when, when we are at home, we plan our trip. So why not in India? So that is the second, I think, most important thing which any user want that, uh, what to say, a travel diary. Like how to, like suppose if I want to go, uh, right now if I want to go to the uh, old city of Jaipur, then how will I go there? I don't know. I don't know the process. If I, if, if I go to Google, then I don't, uh, get the incomplete information how I reach to that old city area. So then the third thing which a user want, a user friendly thing or user want for their trip is uh, the integration, fair integration. Suppose if I have one card, then I can use that card in all public transport modes in auto or in, in any other mode of transport 
if I take the auto and then I then I take the metro, then I take the bus, so I can use one card. We always say one nation, one card. So that kind of thing any user want for their uh, trip. The other important thing is a user wants that uh, integration, a physical integration, I must say. Like, I'll give you a, a small example of this. Uh, my office is at Anand Vihar. Anand Vihar in Delhi. So that's a very prominent uh, place in, in Delhi. At Anand Vihar, you will find a station, a railway station. You'll find a metro line. There are two or three metro lines. You'll find an interstate bus terminal. There is an intracity bus terminal. Everything is there, and that's at the UP border. But you don't find the most important information is information integration. You don't know where to go, how to go, how to reach that particular station. So for every customer who, who is getting down from that railway station don't know how to reach that metro station. So that information is completely missing. It's just one example I'm giving you. So that information is completely missing. So that kind of information a user wants. That's a very simple thing. But these things are missing in most of the uh, places where uh, any user goes. So these, these things user wants. Now, the other important thing at uh, government, as an urban transport expert, I'm just uh, giving these suggestions. So the other thing is that we are seeing that there are a lot of institutions in our city. And they work in silos. When we talk about universal accessibility, we, we develop a world-class metro. We have a world-class metros in various cities. Right now, almost uh, 800 kilometers of metros are running in, in 20 cities. But we, when you get out from that metro station, there is no accessibility. You are on road. You don't find anything where to go. So that kind of uh, user-friendly thing is missing in our planning, what I think. At national level, we have many policy documents. We have National Urban Transport Policy 2006. We have Metro Rail Policy. We have Transit Oriented Development Policy. We have uh, like various reforms. We have all the documents are there in, in, the, in the website. So all these documents talk about the uh, user-friendly things. We mandate. Uh, this uh, last mile connectivity, uh, this uh, NCNC, etc., in metro rail policy. So, but at the implementation level, uh, I don't know, I think there is uh, some issue when we implement these uh, modes of transport. Another challenge at national level, what I think at personal level is that urban transport is not even identified in our constitution. Urban development is there, but urban transport is not there at all in our constitution. It's not even identified in the concurrent list. So I think uh, that's why the rules act, sir, if I'm not uh, wrong, I think you are the pioneers of this. So this is uh, what I feel is another problem in urban mobility so that uh, if we can find the solution so maybe we can give the more user-friendly uh, uh, transport modes to our commuters. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. And I think these are some really pertinent issues. Uh, we'll come to you, sir. Uh, we'll come to you for the question after the panel discussion is over. Sure. So, sure. Yeah. So um, moving next, we have another panelist, Mr. Vivek Kumar. Uh, who is the director of Jaipur Metro Corporation Limited. So we heard uh, Lokesh sir, Loknath sir, Ashish sir talking about uh, sustainable mobility and also promoting alternate mode of transport like bicycling, shared mobility, uh, and, uh, and a, a lot of things uh, other uh, city corporation and metro corporations are adopting. So I would like to ask you how effective do you think these solutions would be in navigating the future of mobility? Uh, especially in the Indian context. Thank you, uh, Economic Times and JC uh, TCF uh, for giving me this opportunity. Can you be a bit louder, please? Uh, okay. Thank you, Economic Times and uh, JC TCL for giving me this opportunity. 
Uh, first of all, I would like to, you know, um, uh, explain my views on uh, uh, sustainable uh, mobility and transportation. See, um, uh, basically we all know that uh, uh, social, economic and uh, environmental, these are the three uh, basic uh, concepts of uh, uh, mo uh, sustainable mobility, uh, which came into existence in 1990s and uh, uh, 1990s. But if you, uh, as per my experience of working in Indian railways, in metro, or even otherwise, what I feel is, uh, since, big, uh, uh, since uh, even pre-independence era, and since beginning we are uh, un uh, already uh, doing this uh, planning and uh, sustainable mobility concept is uh, existing since long. If you uh, see the data of railways, uh, the track which uh, we are using now, 60% of the track is already built uh, uh, in 1950s, in pre-independence. The buildings, if you see uh, the bridges, uh, uh, Mumbai suburban, uh, Calcutta tram, uh, tr uh, tram and uh, these all uh, infrastructure was made uh, in uh, uh, pre-independence era and it is uh, serving and uh, even today's need, needs are being uh, uh, fulfilled by these, this infrastructure. So ye, this shows that our planning was done before we did it and if we talk last mile connectivity, ki baat kare, to, uh, suppose you uh, siding ki baat le almost every industry uh, cement factory ho ya coal mine so andar tak siding gayi hui hai aur jo passenger amenities ki bhi baat kare to everywhere planning was there but somewhere in 1990s kuch aisa hua ki hum log track uh, lose kar gaye and uh, jo uh, sudden jump hua isme apna motor uh, 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 vehicles may private vehicles may and is ke current you have basically the re regions you have economic uh, uh, changes or uh, uh, economy open we कुछ uh, social uh, uh, ये रहे uh, उसके कारण जो 1990s में जाके uh, uh, this happened कि uh, जो uh, basically हमारा uh, problems जो हमें आज जो हम face कर रहे हैं जो again uh, हम लोग यहाँ बैठे हैं और brainstorming करनी पड़ रही है planning कहीं 1990s में uh, ये हो गई uh, absent ho gayi to ultimately now coming to the point jmrc ka jo hamara jo aapka question tha ki uh, 14 kilometers ka hamara network and we have a ridership of uh, 40000 so ki per kilometer ridership hamara it is coming around uh, um, uh, 4000 which is not uh, uh, which is uh, a good uh, this thing aur jisko humne uh, last uh, uh, we have increased and uh, uh, more than 50 percent we have increased it and uh, uh, we have uh, 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 done uh, uh, some effort uh, last night connectivity we have introduced kiya and jo uh, hamare uh, <coughs> Network may railway station and Sindhi camp bus stand or heritage ke jo, uh, points they unko highlight kiya catchment areas ko uh, ye kiya uh, so usse amara uh, jo ridership hai wo pichle uh, uh, 6-8 mahine mein or pichle 1 saal mein almost double hua and uh, last mile connectivity ke liye humne jo e-rickshaws uh, jo uh, Hire किए जो चलाए उसमें हमने उनको को सब्सिडी दी एंड नेक्स्ट एडवांस स्टेज में वी आर डेवलपिंग एप्लीकेशन 
सो लास्ट माइल कनेक्टिविटी के लिए एक एप्लीकेशन हम बनाने की सोच रहे हैं जिसमें इट इट विल बी एम मोबिलिटी एज ए सर्विस कॉन्सेप्ट को लेके कि उसमें पैसेंजर्स कैन यू नो प्लान देयर जर्नी ई रिक्शाज का भी उसमें जीपीएस uh, लगा के लोकेशन रहेगा एंड नेक्स्ट स्टेप में हम लोग जो साइकिल साइकिल्स हैं उसके प्रमोशन के लिए भी फ्री पार्किंग टू साइकिल्स साइकिल्स टेकिंग द साइकिल्स इन द मेट्रोज मेट्रो में कोचेज में साइकिल ले जाएं इस तरह के कॉन्सेप्ट को भी लाने की सोच रहे हैं बिल्कुल विवेक जी आई थिंक यू हैव राइटली प्लान कि मेट्रो तभी सक्सेसफुल होती है जो उसके पेरेफरल्स आपके जैसे चाहे ई रिक्शा हो चाहे कनेक्टिंग रोड ट्रांसपोर्ट हो वो जब तक वहाँ रीचे रीचेबल नहीं होगी मेट्रो वहाँ फ्रॉम होम टू मेट्रो स्टेशन तब तक शायद मेट्रो जब सक्सेसफुल नहीं हो पाएगी एंड वी होप कि जयपुर मेट्रो बिकम्स मोर पॉपुलर इन द सेकंड फेज और थर्ड फेज तो डेफिनेटली ग्रेट थिंग्स यू आर डूइंग मोस्ट ऑफ द स्पीकर टॉक अबाउट इलेक्ट्रिक मोबिलिटी एंड इट्स चैलेंजेस एंड वन ऑफ दैम इज येस इलेक्ट्रिफिकेशन Uh, is there but charging uh, infrastructure is a problem so uh, i will come to bupesh rathod national head of corporate and government advisory yes bank bupesh yes bank is also into advisory and uh, we know that you have been working on ev policies of several states as well as an advisor uh, uh, so uh, i would like to ask you that how this electrification is changing the you know face of urban mobility in the country and what are the you know use cases for more and more ev adoption and what are the you know what can be the impact of this charging in ecosystem also so give us a view because you have worked on ev policies of several states give us some your thoughts on this thanks i think uh, charging infra has been covered in detail so i'll just give you my two cents on the policy side obviously uh, you know many states we have worked with and i'm also working with some of the private sector on their growth advisory uh, in terms of tot transfers and bit louder bupesh please and uh, other such stuff uh, on the charging infra uh, i think uh, you know there is one thing which i which i uh, generally feel is uh, that collaboration is missing collaboration when i say range anxiety maybe it's 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 overly rated in my opinion in some of the segments which are taking at least shape in india right so you're talking about Uh, three wheelers you're talking about two wheelers right and even if you're talking about the stu we are currently talking about the segment which is just 10% representative of the entire bus market right so you have the the uh, the other markets which are still not being tapped upon right so i think initially uh, much talked about if i'm putting the numbers right uh, and particularly for india so the, there's a forecast that we did and there is a focus that we did even for 2047 in a recent uh, or which probably will be launched tomorrow uh, is that by 2030 we see that a cagr growth of a ev will be somewhere around 55% uh, sales and this leads to uh, 13 to 15 million vehicles right and it will be dominated by obviously two wheeler and three wheeler and three wheeler if we currently see uh, the penetration is somewhere around 4.5% this fiscal and it is Uh, the last fiscal and this year i think it is going to touch 8% uh, in terms of the penetration numbers you talk about two wheelers then current today uh, we are talking about 5 to 6% of penetration and maybe this year you will have 8 lakh units sold but what we are talking about is the city limit scooters what we are talking about the is the l3 which is on the lower side right we are not today talking about the l5 we are not today talking about the lcv which will have impact on the grid as well right so we're not saying that you do not prepare as of now but i think charging infra to an extent for these particular use cases have already been taken care uh, maybe to an extent execution seems to be an issue uh, so maybe it, a right institution structure at the state level could be the key uh, is is one one of the points because we meet lot of these players who are trying to establish their own charging infra uh, network and i think the permission Uh, takes a lot of time so that is one such issue which i am aware of uh, spoke about the bus uh, as you see the adoption happening in the other use cases which are your schools your corporate office uh, your office uh, related and intra city uh, 
and then you will have a distributed uh, you know charging infra that is needed and obviously you have some tenders so aggregation if happens at the level of the way we did for uh, buses uh, if you are able to do it at the level of uh, csl and also uh, one thing which i honestly feel is the missing of a business model right so we are talking about the various players in this stage we are talking about the companies who are manufacturing it we are we are talking about uh, the cpos who would play an important role so the how do you bring that element whether it in the form of vgf that we have seen in infrastructure if you bring that particular aspect at least the charging infra which is currently needed where the the volumes are not that high uh, is in my opinion uh, the key pain point uh, for for it to take off at, at such a level so so that's and three points one is the interoperability uh, and one of the points which i honestly think is missing is the standardization whether it is related to the connectors i think that that is one thing where we would urge you know the the uh, the various departments whether it is dst i think those are the aspects while proprietary uh, charging standards are good uh, for a niche but when you're talking about uh, adoption at such a mass level standardization should happen whether you're talking about battery swapping or you're talking about the protocols uh, the connectors that are connecting the EVAC standards, I think that is, that is more important uh, where the government should lay their emphasis on. Right, right. Rupesh, you are very much right. And I think standardization, interoperability, they all will take place when there is a robust and uh, successful business model around electric mobility. Def Absolutely. Definitely. So I think it's a crux of your uh, inputs uh, on the, in this discussion. Uh, our last speaker of this panel discussion, Mr. Kishore Nathani, Principal Advisor of Urban Mass Transit Company Limited, Government of India. Uh, Kishore ji, you are a veteran in the mobility space uh, of years of experience in mobility. So, uh, what about, uh, you know, to ensure the comfortable travel for passenger as well as a zero emission mobility, especially for the cities, uh, how it can be ensured, what can be the policy interventions, your thoughts? आप लोगों को देख नहीं रहा होगा, but हमारी तरफ एक रिवर्स क्लॉक लगी हुई है, और जिसमें हमारा समय तो समाप्त हो चुका है। So, but and जो भी मैं actually बोल रहा हूँ, सब लोग, it's a borrowed information and knowledge which I have, which whatever I would say one cent, not two cents, I'll say about this. See, as far as the commute is concerned, as a commuter, but a simple requirement here as a commuter, मेरे को auto की जैसे flexibility दे दीजिए, metro की जैसे assurance दे दीजिए, और bus के हिसाब से length दे दीजिए, I am more than happy to commute. और जेब जितना भारी रहे उतना अच्छा मेरे लिए है तो खर्चा कम करो। So remove the pain points which I have कि बस कहाँ से मिलेगी वहाँ तक कैसे जाना होगा मेरे को एक flexible auto दे दीजिए बस में पहुँच जाऊँगा मैं खुश हूँ because बस की reliability आपने metro की जैसे कर दी है और safety भी पूरी तरीके से available है। So if you give me all that and somebody used the word here as mobility as a service, so I am more than happy to actually use the services of mobility and I am actually using the roads also optimally. Second point which was on emissions, again, it's a very conflicting requirement, but पुराने टाइम के जब डीडी बोलते थे, डीडी मतलब भूपेश बैठे हमारे सामने वो बोलेंगे डिमांड ड्राफ्ट, वो डिमांड ड्राफ्ट नहीं था, वो दूरदर्शन भी नहीं था, ड्यू डिलिजेंस भी नहीं है, वो है डिग्री ऑफ डिफिकल्टी। आप लोग गेम्स खेलते हैं, जिम्नास्टिक्स में देख लो, ट्रैम्पोलिन में देख लीजिए, आपको नंबर मिलते थे जब आप जंप कर रहे होते स्विमिंग पूल में बोलते थे डिग्री ऑफ डिफिकल्टी 8.8 उसके हिसाब से उसके मार्किंग होती थी 
Similarly, in case of urban mobility, or for that matter, mobility only, increase the degree of difficulty for owning, I would say, a car. Emissions, transport ki wajay se 30% hote hain. 70% of 30% is actually from road sector. 45 to 50% is actually on vehicles on the, in the road sector, which are for passenger. Buses bada minimal hai usme. So if you make it difficult for me to own a car, that would be paradoxical because he is willing to give me funds and I am earning, so I would like to own a car. Make it difficult for me. Second, agar mere paas ek car hai, to aur bhi difficult kar dije mere ko dusra car karidne ki. And uh, the Delhi authorities are actually away. I mean, they are taking steps. Parking ke hisaap se aap kar lo. To make it difficult for me to own a personalized mode of transport. I'm not talking about two wheelers because aspirational India abhi bhi hai, but three wheelers ki zarurat nahi hai, but four wheelers ko make it difficult. That is actually going to help us in improving the emissions as far as the urban sector is concerned. And that is what I would like to say and thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nathani. I think it was the last address of, uh, but uh, quite interesting. And you actually touched upon the layman's problem and how layman can be happy if he, uh, and every aspect of mobility has its own uh, good things like auto, flexibility of auto you spoke about. And uh, so I think uh, uh, it is a collective effort from all the aspects of mobility to make uh, mobility ecosystem sustainable and more uh, usable for uh, people. So here I request now Arpit to uh, do the closing remarks so that we can close the session. So I think without, uh, instead of giving closing remark, let's have a question. Actually, I kept one uh, person in the audience uh, waiting this for question the question. question is to make you realize that we were all the time waking. We were not sleeping after the post lunch session. And the question is about the electric vehicle transition. My question is about the recyclability of the batteries. Is there any policy as on date that the auto manufacturing units would either go for a buyback arrangement from the first time buyer or there would be some kind of concession when the batteries would be replaced because the major investment or the major cost in electrical vehicle is of battery and at the same time the lithium ion battery if discharged into some kind of dumping grounds then perhaps the issue of environment would also come in. So what is the policy on that issue? That's my question. Sir, if I can take this question and then. Uh, so there are two parts uh, and I think uh, I'll have to just check, but I, I guess there was some discussion and I guess that police policy has been notified, which is, uh, which is the, uh, so, so there is, there is one part is, I, I think on the policy front, if I'm not wrong, that is that policy has been not notified by Ministry of Environment and Forest. Uh, which is on the EPR, so extended producer responsibility. I think I think that is that is something. Uh, if I'm not wrong, has been notified, which takes care of where uh, the OEMs uh, become responsible. But we'll have to vet that. Uh, the other part is uh, which is uh, on the battery recycling. Uh, so there is uh, there is a beautiful scheme which is created by, uh, by METI, uh, and uh, I think in last addendum. Uh, probably somewhere in uh, August or July, they included uh, the, uh, the, the backward linkage uh, electronic value chain, uh, which goes into creating, uh, you know, uh, creating equipments or uh, electronic devices, which, which are used for recycling the battery and you can take out the maximum uh, rare mineral, which is, which is present there, right? So these are the two things which I am, uh, currently aware of in terms of the policy, uh, policy, uh, policy thing. And what is the next question? Sorry. I think Thank next question we can take off uh, the dais because uh, we have one more panel discussion to go. Uh, sorry for the inconvenience. Though it was a heavy yet very interesting and very meaningful panel discussion, 
I would like to thank all of you and over to you.